And if you brought your uh, Bible today or your tablet or iPod or whatever it is you use to study the scriptures, let's go ahead and raise this up high and make our weekly declaration together. This is the Word of God. It is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of God abides forever. It's a lamp to my feet and a light into my path. It is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. I believe everything it says. I am who it says I am. I have what it says I have, and I can do what it says I can do. And everyone agreeing said, Amen and Amen. <clears throat> Paul's letter to the Galatian churches, we have discovered, has a threefold focus. The first focus can be found in chapters 1 and 2, and that is grace declared. And uh, Paul declares grace through his own personal testimony in regard to how grace invaded his life. The second focus of the book of Galatians is found in chapters 3 and 4, and that is grace defended. It is in these two strategic chapters that we find the doctrine of grace, sola gratia, as uh, Martin Luther would say, grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And so this is Paul's theology of grace. And then the third and the final focus is in chapters 5 and 6, and this is where grace is depicted. So grace declared, grace defended, grace depicted where uh, Paul, he shares with us and he instructs us in regard to what it looks like to live a grace-filled life. How we can do that 24-7, whether we're in the meeting place or the workplace, or the marketplace. And we saw last week as we entered into chapter 3, where we will be at again this morning, that Paul, he exhorted the Galatians to remember three things. In verse 1, he exhorted them to remember what Christ did for them. He talks about Jesus Christ, who was publicly portrayed as crucified. And so Paul, he is exhorting these Galatian churches to remember Christ crucified. Remember the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Remember the cross. Remember that it was on the cross that Jesus died for your sins. The second thing that he reminds them of is that he reminds them what the Holy Spirit has accomplished in them in verses 2 and 3. He says to the Galatians, I have only one question for you. Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected in the flesh? And so he wants them to remember what the Holy Spirit has done, what the Holy Spirit has accomplished in our lives. Having begun or started by the Spirit, Remember that you're also being sustained by that same Spirit. And then the third thing that he exhorts the Galatian churches to remember is that in verse 5, he wants them to remember what the Father has promised to them. He says, the Spirit that God has provided, and he then goes on and mentions the God 
who works miracles amongst you. And so he is reminding them of both the presence and the power of God in their lives. That they should not be relying on the natural of man, but rather the supernatural of God. And so he, he, he says, remember these things because they are very vital in order for you to be grounded in your faith. And last week we took the entire morning to talk about this God that works miracles amongst us. And we saw how miracles, first of all, are a confirmation of Christ doctrine. Jesus taught about miracles in the life and the ministry of his church. Much of Jesus' message revolved around miracles, and much of Jesus' ministry revolved around miracles. So miracles are a confirmation of Christ's doctrine. Second, miracles are a demonstration of Christ's kingdom. When Jesus sent out the 70 to go to various towns and villages that he was going to visit himself. He says, when you go before me, heal the sick, cast out demons, and when this takes place, tell them, declare that the kingdom of God has come upon them. Declare that the kingdom of God is near. The third thing that we discovered about miracles is that miracles are a manifestation of Christ's glory. Every miracle performed in the New Testament is for the glory of God. It is for the glory of Christ. The same thing is true in the Old Testament as well. And so miracles are always attached to glory and specifically not the glory of man, but rather the glory of Christ, this miracle maker, you see. And then the fourth thing that we discovered about the nature of miracles is that miracles are a revelation of Christ's nature. You see, Jesus is not just a good man, he is the God-man. He is both son of man and son of God. And by his very entrance into the earth, through the virgin birth, there is an announcement that miracles are at hand, and it revealed the nature of of Christ. It revealed his divinity, his, his deity. And so that catches us up to today. And this morning, we're going to continue to look in chapter 3, where we once again see grace defended in Paul's doctrine, his, his theology of grace. And he continues to build upon this uh, in the rest of chapter 3 and into chapter 4. And Paul, he does so by pointing the Galatians to Abraham. And so so if you haven't yet turned in your Bibles to Galatians, if you're not familiar with it, Galatians is in your New Testament. You have the four Gospels, then you have Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians chapter 3, and we will be picking up this morning in verse 6, and we'll be reading and just basically studying verses 6, 7, and 8. And so verse 6 says, even so, Abraham believed God. Now, your New International Version, I really like what it says, for even so, it says, consider Abraham. Abraham believed God. And it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. The scripture, check this out, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. And so, those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. And so, 
Again, as the New International Version uh, says and, and, and challenges us, consider Abraham. You know, some of our best times are spent considering the things of God and reflecting upon the various men and women of God in the Scriptures. And Abraham would certainly <laughs> fall into that category. We should be well acquainted as Christians with Abraham and his life and his calling. And so we, we need to be people who consider who reflect upon the things of God and upon the people of God. And so why this is important specifically to the Galatians is that Abraham was a big deal with the Jewish people. He was a big deal with these Judaizers who were basically, as we've seen, a Christian cult that was negatively influencing the Galatian churches. They had snuck in, they, they had seduced them into believing a different gospel, which was a false gospel. And so Paul, he's drawing from the life of Abraham because Abraham was a big deal with the Jewish people. And he does the same thing with Moses. Moses is also a big deal amongst the Jewish people. And so this is what I want you to understand as we study throughout uh, chapter 3 specifically, is that when Paul speaks of the law, he is referencing Moses, the lawgiver. And when he speaks of faith, he is referencing Abraham, the man of faith who came before Moses. And so Paul, he uses two very strategic key figures in the Old Testament that, listen, would have the highest and the greatest authority amongst the Jews and amongst these Judaizers. And the ultimate thing that Paul <laughs> is trying to communicate is this. He, he's trying to communicate that both Moses and Abraham point us to Jesus. Now, you're in Galatians 3. Let's look again at verse 8. <clears throat> he says, The Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the nations will be blessed in you. Look in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. He goes on, and he says, Therefore the law, remember Moses is the lawgiver, therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. Why? So that we may be justified by faith. And so, why do we consider Abraham? Well, because both Moses and Abraham pointed us to Jesus. The second reason is that Paul is communicating is that Jesus is greater than both Abraham and Moses put together. You guys might uh, recall in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 58, Jesus is addressing the, the Pharisees. They want to know who he thinks he is. And Jesus said, before Abraham was born, I am. And of course, this is a reference to God's message to Moses when he said, tell them <laughs> that I am sent you. And he told Moses, I am that I 
am. Jesus, my friends, is the great I am. And what Paul is communicating here is that Jesus proceeds, or excuse me, precedes and supersedes both Abraham and Moses because before they even existed, Jesus said, I am. He preceded them. He supersedes them. And so again, why are we commanded to consider this man, Abraham? Well, because Abraham was the father of our faith. Now, some of you uh, <laughs> who grew up in church, I, I didn't have that privilege, but some of you who grew up the church and you went to vacation Bible school or you went to youth camp, you probably learned a song called Father Abraham. You guys remember that? Okay, we're going to do that right now. No. <laughs> All the college students are saying, yes! <laughs> All our guests are saying, no! <laughs> we will spare us all. But remember the song, Father Abraham? It is built on a spiritual truth. And so we consider Abraham, listen, because his life models what our lives should look like. You see, Abraham is a prophetic picture of the gospel message, and we see here how God actually showed or announced to Abraham the gospel when Abraham was alive. And so you see, Abraham fully understood the gospel message, and for both his and all our benefit, he modeled a life of faith. And guys, one of the things that we discover as we study scripture is how God is attracted to faith. Let me say that again. God is attracted to faith. You see, Faith, whether it be in a person's life or in the life of a church, is very, very attractive to God. You see, where faith is, God is. And so faith, it, it not only appeals to God, it also attracts God. Faith is what gets God's attention. Now, some people in this life especially in Hollywood, they, they long for a facelift. But you see, the church should long for a faith lift because our faith is sagging when God wants it to be surging. <clears throat> and so there's three very, very vital, important truths that in verses 6, 7, and 8 that Paul wants us to know when it comes to the topic of faith. And these are very important things that we must know, that we must be grounded in as <coughs> sons and daughters of God. And so the very first thing that Paul wants us to understand in regard to the importance of faith is that the importance of faith is that of hearing with faith. Again, hearing with faith. Let's look at two verses here. The verse, first verse is in verse 2 of chapter 3. Paul again says, This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law, or notice, by hearing with faith? And then in verse 5, he says... So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit, the presence of God, and works miracles among you, the power of God, do it by the works of the law or by hearing with 
faith. And so this phrase, hearing with faith, is very important. Guys, unless we listen with ears of faith, God's Word is going to have very little, if any, impact upon our lives. And that's one reason some people, they never get anything out of reading God's Word or listening to a message like this. Because, you see, in order for it to fully benefit us, we must be listening with faith. We must be doing so in faith. How often do we approach the Scriptures with a spirit of faith rather than just wanting some more information? And so, hearing with faith is key to our growth in the things of God. And so, hearing with faith, it requires us to have spiritual ears. Jesus put it this way. He said, let him who has ears hear, or let him who has ears to hear, let him hear what it is, the Spirit is saying. And you see, that's a key. We have to discern and hear what it is that the Spirit of God is saying versus what the Spirit of this world is saying. And so the voice of the Spirit is always, always, always leading you to faith and it must be met with faith. Paul, when he was writing the church in Corinthians, in Corinth, he told them in 2 uh, Corinthians that we walk by faith and not by sight. In Romans 10, 17, he told the church of Rome, so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And so Paul wants us to understand that faith comes by hearing. But oftentimes, if we were to be honest, we want faith to come by seeing, don't we? And though that can indeed incur, we can see an answer to prayer, we can see a miracle of the Lord, we can see a number of things take place. And that will spark and build our faith, and that is a good thing. But you see, God's kingdom doesn't always work that way. The immature Christian says, when I see it, I'll believe it. The mature Christian says, when I believe it, I'll see it. And you see, it is a totally different perspective than that which the world has in regard to things. And so, everything we listen to should be filtered through ears of faith. There's a lot of white noise out there. There's a lot of static. There, there, there's a lot of different voices that are vying for our attention. Well, faith, it sorts through all of that. And when it connects with truth, when it connects with God's promise, when it connects with God's Word, it ignites the work of the Holy Spirit both in us and through us. And you see, that's why Paul is so hard on these Galatian churches. It's really because eternity weighs in the balance. Paul is chastising the Galatian churches because of this. Listen, they were abandoning a life of faith for a life of works. They were abandoning the supernatural for the natural. And so that's why Paul says, hey, I just want to know one thing, just one thing. Having begun by the Spirit, a supernatural work of God Himself, God the Holy Spirit. Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected, matured by the flesh? 
by the works of of the law? Are, 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 are you now going to be perfected in your faith through natural means? And so, what we need to understand is that our ears are intended to be faith filters. That's why God has given us spiritual ears. Is so that they might be faith filters. And that's why it's important that we be listening to the right things and the right people for the right reasons. And so when someone or something tries to enter our thoughts or tries to enter our minds and it is not of faith, what our response should be, what we should say, is sorry, that is not allowed here. This is a faith-only zone. And oh, how God's people would do so much better if they lived in a faith-only zone. Or sorry, you are speaking a foreign language. There's only one language spoken here, and that is the language of faith. And yet how often do we speak the language of, of fear or, or the natural or the what if and the if onlys in life. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 3 and 5, I hope this is in your notes. If not, would you write uh, 2 Corinthians? As a matter of fact, it's just a few pages from where we're at in Galatians 3. Just turn left. And you'll get real uh, quick to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 5. And let's look at this together. <clears throat> Paul writes, For though we walk in the flesh, in other words, this natural body, we do not war, spiritual war, according to the flesh. For the weapons, the spiritual weapons of our war warfare are not of the flesh or the natural, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking captive every thought to the obedience of Christ. Wow. Such powerful, powerful words. You know, Paul, he felt so strongly about a life of faith that he actually said this. Whatever is not of faith is sin. Now marinate on that for a while. Think about that. Whatever is not of faith is sin. Now, why does he say this? Well, because the way of the kingdom is lived out through the highway of faith. If we get off of that road, we will find ourselves trapped in quicksand or running off a cliff or driving into a pit. And you see, that is exactly what was happening to the Galatian believers, the Galatian churches. They were quickly becoming shipwrecked and desperately needed to be rescued. And that is why Paul wrote his letter to the Galatian churches, is because they were headed in a wrong direction. They were following a different gospel. And therefore, eternity weighed in the balance. And he realized that they needed to be rescued from the direction that they were headed in. And so, when it comes to this hearing with faith, we need to understand some things. First, what we need to do is we need to ground our ears to the voice of the Spirit. We need to ground our ears to the voice of the Spirit. To him who has ears, let him hear what, let's say it out loud, the Spirit is saying. 
So ground your ears to the voice of the Spirit. Second, we need to guard our ears with the voice of faith. Remember, our ears are a filter. And so we must guard what is coming in through ears of faith. And we must make sure that faith, listen, faith is always standing guard over our ears. And what it is that we're hearing and what it is that we're listening to. And then we need to govern our ears with the voice of faith. You see, the voice of faith is what we listen to. The voice of faith leads and guides and directs our life. We walk by faith, not by sight. But oh, how often we do just the opposite. We trust in the natural. We walk by what we see in our natural, fleshly station versus the spiritual position and posture that God wants us to live in and walk in and minister in. And so the first order of importance is, is hearing with faith. The second thing that Paul wants these Galatian churches to know and have their lives founded upon is the importance of our identity through faith. You see, our identity in Christ is only through faith. Remember, grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That is our identity. And we read about this in verse 7. <laughs> it says this, Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. And so Paul, he is telling us here that faith is what identifies us as sons and daughters of Abraham, and as a result, we are also sons and daughters of God. You see, it's not church membership. It's not having your name on a roll. It's not going to church. It's not singing in the choir. It's not, uh, you know, being part of a home group. Now, all those things are, are, are great, except for maybe one. But membership. But we need to understand that none of those things save us. None of those things justify us. And that is what Paul is trying to get across. Where do you find your identity? And so what we need to understand is that faith is a gate which grants us entrance into the kingdom of God and that which our identity is found. And so abandon faith and you abandon your identity. And so the, the Christian church is a part of Abraham's heritage. We are sons and daughters of Abraham, and this is strategic because, again, remember, Paul is using Abraham, who is a hero to the Jewish nation, to say, if you want to identify with Abraham, your hero, you are going to have to have a faith-based relationship with God, not a works-based relationship with God. And we discover something about Abraham and his, his life. And it's in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. <clears throat> Let's read this out loud together, shall we? Let's begin. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. 
That, my friends, is the life of faith. How we want to control things, how we want to know how everything falls into place. But that was not the case with Father Abraham. He lived a life of faith. When he was called, he went out to a place that he did not know where God was leading him to. And so Paul, he also points out that, that the, this heritage, it's a spiritual heritage, not so much a natural or a physical heritage. In other words, the true connection to Abraham is spiritual in nature, not physical. And so it is not where you were physically born, but how you were spiritually born into the kingdom of God. It, was, it is when we are born again. And that is why the Gentiles could also be considered part of the children of Abraham. They too were children of Abraham because they too were born into God's kingdom through faith. <laughs> And loved ones, as Christians, we need to understand that we are not self-made people, as the saying goes. We don't do it our way, as the song goes. We are a faith-made people. It is faith which must shape and form our lives. Because as Paul states back in verse 3, to abandon faith is the act of a fool. Oh, you foolish Galatians. It is a foolish decision that would result in a foolish life and a foolish faith, and the result will be the fate of a fool. Trusting in ourselves and our own goodness rather than trusting in God and His goodness. Now, it was early this month that I had the privilege to share uh, at Solid Rock, our college and career ministry, and I was asked to teach on our identity in Christ. And so as I opened up uh, my message to the Solid Rock, uh, Rock group, I, I shared with them how there is a great crisis that is in the world today. And it is really affecting people worldwide, and it is what is called identity theft. Identity theft. And you know, Jesus said this. He said, the enemy is only out to steal, to kill, and destroy. You see, identity theft is nothing new in the kingdom of God. Because from its very inception, Satan has been trying to rob us of our identity in Christ, to steal our identity in Christ. You see, Satan wants us to take on a false identity, and that is exactly what is happening to the Galatian churches. They rejected their true identity in Christ, which is found by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and they were depending upon themselves and the works of the law. And you know, I, I, I find it interesting that one of the questions that Jesus asked before his crucifixion and his resurrection was this. When the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? On the earth? An interesting question indeed. Perhaps this is why Timothy wrote, In the last days many will fall away from the faith. And so whether it is a faith that saves us or the faith that sustains us, they're both the same thing, by the way. The very same faith that saves us is the very same faith that sustains us and sanctifies us and secures us in the things of God. When I return, is there going to be faith on the earth? 
And that's why Paul is talking about the importance of hearing with faith, the importance of finding our identity in Christ through faith. And then the third and really the most important thing is found in verse 8, and that is the importance of knowing that we are justified, we are made right with God by faith. <clears throat> Notice verse 8. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. Wouldn't you have loved to have been there? Saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. And then verse 9, so then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham the believer. We are justified by faith. What powerful words. The just shall live by faith. And you know, it was this verse, the just shall live by faith, it's this truth that literally revolutionized and transformed Martin Luther's life and ministry. As he was reading through the book of Galatians, there was a paradigm shift. There was a revelation from heaven that came to him. And faith came alive with these words, the just shall live by faith. And this, my friends, is what gave birth to the Protestant Reformation in 1517. Again, this month, October 31st, we are celebrating its 500 year anniversary. But let me tell you, as I've told you before, the church is just as much in need of reformation today as it was back in Paul's time and in Martin Luther's time. Oh, how the church needs to be reformed. And oh, how that reformation is intended not to just change the church, but to impact and change the world around us. Now Paul, when he talks about being justified by faith, He's drawing from an Old Testament passage out of Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. And Habakkuk was written around 605 B.C. This passage, this verse in Habakkuk, it was a prophetic promise that was setting the stage of what would be the norm amongst God's people, and that is a life of faith. And we see in, the, in a few verses how this is being confirmed and offered. Let's read these three verses out loud together, shall we? <clears throat> Habakkuk 2, verse 4. Let's begin. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him. But the righteous will live by his faith. Now, what proud one is he referring to? Self-righteous pride. The self-righteous, prideful people. That they are, see themselves as good enough. And therefore, they don't need the goodness of God. Hebrews 10 38. Let's begin. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. And then Romans 1.17. Let's begin. But in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Paul in Romans 1.17, he is referring to Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. And so, there's two key words in these verses that we have looked at this morning. And those two words are Abraham believed. Would you say those two words out loud with me? Abraham believed. It was Martin Luther who said the first duty of man is to believe in God 
and honor him with his faith. The first duty of man is to believe in God and to honor him with his faith. And so Paul is saying this to wrap things up. He's saying, okay, you guys honor Abraham, rightly so. You guys admire him, and rightly so. So, let's begin with Abraham, shall we? And let's learn how this man of faith, this friend of God, was justified before God. Let's see how he was made righteous in God's eyes. It's not because he left his country. It's not because he left his relatives. It's not because he left his father's house. It's not because he was circumcised. It's not because he even stood ready to sacrifice his own son Isaac in whom the promise was given. As great as all those things were, Abraham was justified because he believed. Because he believed. And so Paul is appealing to the Galatians. He's exhorting them. And he's saying, don't complicate this. You're throwing in all types of stuff that is only complicating your relationship with God. It's confusing you in your relationship with God. It's not that these other things are bad, but there's only one thing that is necessary. Abraham believed. So simple, so sound, so secure, so satisfying. And guys, such is the same with us. Let's, let's stop complicating things. Let's start confusing, stop confusing things. Just like Abraham believed, so too we believe. That is our connection with Abraham. And it is a faith that is simple, sound, secure, and satisfying. And so we discover this morning a simple spiritual truth, a spiritual principle, and it's this. Just like faith honors God, God honors faith. Would you stand with me? And let's close with this uh, prayer. Let's pray it together out loud. Let's begin. Righteous God and Father, we thank you that you have called us to a life of faith. Teach us the importance of hearing with faith. Teach us how our identity is realized through faith. And may there be a growing fascination of the truth that we are justified by faith. Grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, we pray. Amen and amen. I'm going to ask the elders, the prayer team, to come forward. And if you have need of prayer this morning regarding anything, we welcome you to come and to be prayed for. It's really a, a great opportunity to bring our needs before God where there can be two or more agreeing together. So wherever you're at, maybe you need physical healing, maybe you're between jobs, maybe you have some relationship struggles that you're going through, you know, we could go and add infinitum, right? This world has many troubles. Believe in God, believe also in me, Jesus said. Would you bring whatever it is to the cross of Christ? Would you bring it to Jesus? And in faith, we will stand together with you, believing God's best for your life. And should you be here, maybe this is the first time you've ever been to, to church. Maybe you're new to Christianity. You know, the church has a tendency to complicate things. We really do. 
We, we, we don't always make it easy for the world to believe and understand. Part of it is our hypocrisy. We, we, we still struggle with things. We still sin. We still stumble. We still fall. But by the grace of God, He picks us back up and we continue on. And sometimes we, we want people to think that it's being good or it's being religious that grants you entrance into the kingdom of heaven. And that's a lie. It's a flat out lie. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And if you've never truly placed your faith in Jesus, He is the author and perfecter of faith. That means He'll start it, and that means He'll carry you to the very end, and He will finish it. Philippians 1.6, I am confident of this very thing, that He who began a good work in you will perfect it, mature it, until the day of Christ Jesus. And so it is a matter of faith because faith matters. And it matters to God. And if you come to Him in faith, you're going to get His attention this morning. And He will forgive you of your sins. He will cleanse you of unrighteousness. He will set you free. He will give you a future and a hope. It's the best deal ever. Consider Abraham, this man of faith. And may that be where our identity is found as well. I would encourage you to come to this great and gracious God today. And you can do that by coming and sharing with somebody up here. I, I want to be prayed for. I want to learn more. I want to give my life to Jesus through faith. Or maybe turn to the person next to you and say, hey, can you help me with this? Can you pray with me? God bless you guys. Grace alone, sola gracias. Faith alone, sola fide. In Christ alone, sola Christus. That is who we are. And that is what we declare week in and week out. God bless you guys.
putting our faith in. Jesus, for whatever little bit of faith that we have, God, I ask that you would grow it. And so we sing in faith, Jesus, that we will praise you as we know that you're good, Lord. We know that you have the best plans for us, Jesus, so we trust you. We place our faith in you right now, God, as we praise you. pray that you would lead us this week, Lord. Show us how to trust you more. Challenge us in those places where we're not trusting you, God. Thank you, Father. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.